Okay, today is the 31st of August. We missed two nights of talks, uh, the 29th and the 30th. Uh. Uh, so now we are on the Satipatthana Sangyutta. But before we proceed with the Sutta itself, uh, I'd like to explain a little about the practice of Satipatthana. Because the other day somebody asked me about the question how to practice Satipatthana, so I thought uh, I will spend a little bit of time to explain. Now, this uh, there's a bit of confusion nowadays uh, on the practice of Sampajanya, Sati, Satipatthana, Samadhi. In the Buddha's teachings, uh, he talk about Sati Sampajanya. So the other day we went to the suttas. Uh, we saw uh, that Sampajanya means mindfulness. La. Sampajanya means uh, mindfulness, general mindfulness. La. More of mindfulness of the body. La. How you, when you walk, you know you're walking. When you sit, you know you're sitting. When you eat, you know you're eating. When you drink, and you change your clothes, etc. Now, later, you find uh, there's a sutta that refers to mindfulness of the mind. So, Sampajanya is general mindfulness. General mindfulness uh, helps us uh, to keep our attention focused, not scattered. Because in meditation, what we are trying to do uh, is to walk the path uh, to destruction of the asavas, liberation, uh, Attainment of arahanhood na, means destruction of the asavas. So, that is our aim. La. So, before you can totally destroy the asavas, uh, at least uh, you have to keep it under control. And asavas, uh, as I mentioned before, my interpretation, uh, asavas means uncontrolled mental outflows. La. The mind uh, flowing without control. La. Stray thoughts, daydreaming, and all that. Nah. So, we want to keep a check on it, nah, not allow it to flow. So, Sampajanya, mindfulness, nah, helps in that respect. Nah. But you should notice, nah, in the Noble Eightfold Path, general mindfulness nah, is not a factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Sampajanya is not a factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. But Sati is... Sati is remembering to put your attention on only four things. La. The body, feelings, mind and Dhamma. So Sati means recollection. La. Recalling these four things. Always remembering la, to recall these four things instead of putting your attention out la, into Mara's field, la, Mara's domain, la, which is sights, sounds, smells, taste and touch and thoughts. La. Because the Buddha says, uh, if we pay attention to the objects of the sixth sense basis, uh, then uh, we get caught uh, because Mara is trying to bait us, uh, give us beautiful sights to see, uh, nice sounds, nice uh, odors, great taste and all that. Uh. So that's why the Buddha says, uh, we have to keep to our domain, to our home ground. That we are safe, huh? that is, to keep our attention on the four objects of sati. Huh? Now, sati huh, is the, or sama sati, huh, is the seventh factor, the noble eightfold path. So, sama sati, right recollection, huh, is just what I mentioned just now, huh, always keeping your attention huh, on these four things, huh, not to stray out of these four objects. Huh. Uh, to contemplate these four objects. Uh. And then, uh, in the in the uh, Noble Eightfold Path, Sama Samadhi, right concentration, is the four jhanas. The four jhanas. Now, in the Majjhima Nikaya Sutta 117, uh, the Buddha says, uh, the practice of the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, we start with right view. We must always start with right view, uh. Right view means hearing the suttas, the words of the Buddha. Then after that, uh, having heard 
the words of the Buddha and attaining right view, uh, you enter the stream already, uh, you're an Arya. Then because you have right view, uh, you will naturally uh, begin to have right thoughts. Uh, once you understand uh, what right view means, uh, then you know uh, the importance of right thoughts. Uh, so you always watch your thoughts. Uh, don't have greed, don't have uh, intention of harming others, uh, uh, having ill will, uh, anger. Uh, these three are wrong thoughts. Lah. So we counter it uh, with right thoughts, lah, the opposite. Lah. So after you attain right thoughts, uh, you will lead you uh, to right speech. Because why? To talk, uh, before you talk, uh, you must think first. Uh, what you think uh, determines what comes out of your mouth. Uh, so right thoughts determines your right speech. And when you have right speech, uh, because you have right thoughts and right speech, uh, you will also naturally uh, have right action because it's motivated by right thoughts ma, and right view. Ma, right view uh, will help you uh, to control your actions. Uh, so you have right actions and also following that, uh, you have right livelihood. Uh, livelihood is a natural consequence uh, of having right view, right thoughts, right speech, right action. Uh, right. Uh, so you will have right livelihood. After you have right livelihood, uh, if you proceed further, uh, that means you walk the path uh, to the holy path. Uh, then uh, you will also have right effort. Uh. Right effort actually is an extension of right thoughts. Uh. Right thoughts means you watch your mind. Uh. Uh, so right effort is also the same. Any unwholesome states arise in your mind, you discard it. Uh, and then you encourage wholesome states of, of mind to arise. Uh. So that's right effort. And then after that, uh, once you have right effort, uh, then you also begin uh, to have right sati. Uh, that means you try to guard your sense doors. Uh, you don't let your attention stray out to the six sense doors. Uh, instead, uh, you pull it back. Uh, always remember to pull it back to the four objects of sati. Uh, that's why sati has a lot to do with remembering. Uh, it is not general mindfulness. It is a specific mindfulness directed only to four things, uh, right? So now, what is it uh, from sati uh, that goes to samadhi? Uh, this one, uh, a lot of uh, monks don't explain. Because the Buddha says, uh, the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, one leads to another. Uh, one leads to another. So sati uh, must lead to samadhi. So how does sati lead to samadhi? The link uh, between sati and samadhi uh, is sati patana. A lot of books, uh, they translate uh, Satipatthana as foundations of mindfulness, establishments of mindfulness and all that. Uh. But it doesn't show a difference uh, between Sati and Satipatthana. They assume as though Sati and Satipatthana is almost the same thing. Uh, there's a great difference uh, between Sati and Satipatthana. As we read in the suttas uh, the other day, uh, if you practice Satipatthana correctly, uh, it must lead you to the jhanas. Remember the sutta and the Buddha talk about the clever cook and the stupid cook. The clever cook, uh, he notices the taste of the master. The stupid cook doesn't notice uh, what his master likes to eat. Uh. So in the same way, a skillful monk, uh, when he meditates, uh, he has to notice uh, what the mind inclines towards, uh, what the mind likes. Uh. Uh, the object of meditation and the environment and all that. Uh. So, in that sutta, the Buddha said, uh, the skillful monk, when he practices satipatthana, uh, he must attain samadhi. If, if he does not attain samadhi, then the sutta says uh, he is unskillful. And on top of that, the sutta says uh, that he is not practicing satisampajanya. He thinks he is practicing satisampajanya, but he is actually not practicing satisampajanya because it does not end up. Uh, the end result uh, is not the samadhi, uh, the jhanas. So satipatthana, as I translated uh, the other day, uh, is intense state, intense state of sati. Uh. Why intense? Because the simile given by the Buddha on how to practice Satipatthana was this man uh, who was caught uh, and forced to carry a bowl of oil in between a great crowd of people uh, watching the beautiful girl of the land uh, dancing and singing. So there's a man following him behind uh, with an uplifted sword uh, ready to chop off his head. Uh. 
if he spills a drop of the oil, even a drop of the oil, his head will go off. So he has to walk uh, with all his attention uh, on that bowl of oil. He dare not make a slip. Uh, uh, dare not look left, dare not look right. Pay full attention to that bowl of oil all the time. Watching one object uh, all the time. So that, that simile was given by the Buddha to make us understand how to practice Satipatthana. So when we practice Satipatthana uh, in that way, watching one object uh, without changing our attention to any other object, uh, it must end up uh, with jhana, one-pointedness of mind. Uh, so from here you can understand uh, how the practice of sati, if you intensify it uh, until it becomes intense sati, uh, that will lead you to samadhi. Uh. That's why the other day we read one uh, sutta where it was mentioned uh, that uh, he attained the first jhana. Then uh, he was happy uh, that his object uh, had been achieved uh, because he was meditating, for example, on the breath. Uh, then he put his uh, vitaka and vichara, thought directed and sustained uh, on the breath, uh, on the object. Uh, then he went into the first jhana. After having to the first jhana, the sutta says uh, that he was satisfied, uh, that he had attained his objective. And after that, uh, he withdrew the mind uh, from that object. Uh. And I mentioned uh, he withdrew his mind by focusing instead uh, on piti and sukha. When he put his attention on piti and sukha, he entered the second jhana uh, because he dropped off the vitaka and vichara. So, uh, so that's the point I want to make uh, that uh, there's a difference between sati and satipatthana. And that satipatthana, if you practice it, uh, it must lead you to samadhi, the eighth factor. Just as the Majjhima Nikaya 117 says, uh, you when you practice the seventh factor, it must lead you to the eighth factor. Not only that, I like to point out something uh, which a lot of people don't notice. Uh. In the suttas, the Buddha always says uh, that to attain liberation, uh, you need two things, samatha and vipassana. But instead nowadays, uh, some vipassana monks say, uh, you don't need right concentration. Or the interpretation of right concentration is momentary concentration, uh, which is not concentration at all according to the suttas. Uh. In the suttas, uh, the Buddha standard uh, of samadhi concentration uh, are the jhanas. Nothing short of the jhanas. Anything short of the jhanas uh, is not up to the Buddha's mark, uh, not up to the Buddha's standard. Uh. That's why in the suttas, Buddha always talks about the four jhanas. So samadhi can refer to any of the four jhanas, but perfect samadhi uh, must be the fourth jhana. Uh, that's why in the suttas, Majjhima Nikaya, the Buddha says uh, that an anagamin uh, and an arahan, uh, the precondition to becoming an anagamin and an arahan uh, is the four jhanas. Perfect samadhi. So, now, so we were saying uh, that samatha and vipassana are two necessary conditions uh, for liberation. There are several suttas uh, in the Nikayas uh, that says this very clearly. Uh. For example, the sutta about the, the messenger bringing the message uh, to the lord of the city. Uh, uh, the two messengers, uh, uh, they bring the Samatha and Vipassana. So, now, what is Samatha and what is Vipassana? Samatha, if you practice it, it will lead you to Samadhi, the eight factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Now, Vipassana is contemplation. And contemplation is contemplation of the four things, the four objects of Sati, the body, feelings, mind and Dhamma. So, the practice of the seventh factor of the Noble Eightfold Path Samasati, uh, that is vipassana. That is vipassana. Okay. So, if you only practice vipassana, you are only practicing up to the seven factor. Uh, so, you need the eight factor. So, you cannot say uh, you only want to practice pure vipassana. You don't want the jhanas. Because if you do that, then you are practicing seven factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, not eight. So it must be very clear, the seven factor and the eight factor are completely different. 
the seventh factor is vipassana, the eighth factor uh, is samatha. So you need both la, samatha and vipassana. And that's why in the one of the suttas we read earlier, uh, the Buddha says there are five conditions uh, that lead to the disappearance of the true Dhamma. And one of them uh, is no respect for samadhi, no respect for the jhanas, uh, saying that it is not necessary. Uh, just like some monks nowadays, they say jhana is not necessary. Pure vipassana is enough. Uh, this is, the Buddha gave a warning that this type of teaching uh, will lead to the disappearance of the true Dhamma. Because in the suttas, the Buddha says uh, that the jhanas are the footprints of the Buddha. So if you want to follow the Buddha's uh, steps uh, to enlightenment, uh, you must follow his footprints, namely uh, attain the jhanas. Uh. So that's enough what I want to say about the sati and satipatthana. Okay, tonight we come to the last three suttas I'm going to talk uh, on the satipatthana. Sangyutta, Sutta 47.35, that's on page 1657, at Sabati, Buddha said, monks, a monk should dwell collected and mindful or clearly aware. This is our instruction to you. And how monks is a monk collected or recollected? Dear monks, a monk dwells contemplating the body in the body. Feelings in feelings, mind in mind, dhamma in dhamma, ardent, clearly aware, collected, having removed covetousness and grief in regard to the world. It is in this way, monks, that a monk is collected, sato, which means uh, having sati. And how monks does a monk exercise clear awareness, sampajano, here monks. For a monk, feelings are understood as they arise, understood as they remain present, understood as they pass away. Thoughts are understood as they arise, understood as they remain, understood as they pass away. Perceptions are understood as they arise, understood as they remain present, understood as they pass away. It is in this way, monks, that a monk exercises clear awareness. Monks, a monk should, should dwell collected and clearly aware or mindful. This is our instruction to you. That's the end of the sutta. So in this sutta, it's slightly different uh, from a previous sutta we, we read, uh, which explained these same two things, uh, sati and sampajanya. The sati part, the top part, uh, is exactly the same uh, as in the previous sutta. But the bottom part uh, about sampajanya, mindfulness uh, or clear awareness, uh, is slightly different. Uh. In the previous sutta, the Buddha talked about mindfulness of our bodily actions. But here, the Buddha says that Sampajanya can also mean mindfulness of our feelings, our thoughts and our perceptions. So, in other words, it is mindfulness of our feelings and our mind. So, here there's an overlap because in the practice of Sati, we are also supposed to be aware when our feelings change, when our thoughts change, when our perceptions change and all that. Uh, so when you are aware, then you can understand yourself better. For example, when certain feelings arise, you don't try not to react. You know that they are impermanent. The Buddha gave a simile of feelings like raindrops falling on the pond. When the raindrops fall on the pond, on the surface of the pond, bubble appears and in a short while it, it breaks up and then another drop of water or raindrop falls on the pond another bubble appears and it breaks so in the same way our six sense bases this sense objects impinge on our six sense bases like sights impinge on the eye sounds impinge on the ear etc in the same way a feeling arises uh, and then it doesn't last very long, uh, it disappears. La. But it continues to be there uh, if you think about it. La. For example, somebody says something nasty to you uh, and an uh, unpleasant feeling arises. And then you start thinking about it, uh, then the unpleasant feeling persists. La. So that's why uh, the, the Buddha says uh, we have to be careful. La. That's why we want to keep keep an eye la, on our feelings and keep an eye on our thoughts. So if certain thoughts arise, uh, then we have to try to understand what is the motive behind the thoughts. 
what or what uh, is the thought motivated by? Is it the ego? Is it uh, motivated by anger? Uh, then if you if it is, uh, then you know uh, that you have an unwholesome state of mind, uh, and you try to discard it. Uh. So this uh, mindfulness of the feelings and of the mind uh, is quite important. Uh, so it is also stated uh, to be connected with sati and also to be connected with some pajanya uh, mindfulness. Uh. The next sutta is forty seven point forty. The Buddha said, monks, I will teach you the intense states of recollection and the development of the intense states of recollection and the way leading to the development of the intense states of recollection. Listen to that. And what monks is Satipatthana, intense state of recollection. Here monks, a monk dwells contemplating the body in the body, garden, clearly aware, collected, having removed covetousness and grief in regard to the world. He dwells contemplating feelings in feelings, mind in mind, dhamma in dhamma. This is called the Satipatthana, intense state of recollection. And what monks is the development of the intense state of recollection? Here monks, a monk dwells contemplating the nature of origination or arising in the body. He dwells contemplating the nature of vanishing or ceasing in the body. He dwells contemplating the nature of origination and vanishing in the body. Ardent, clearly comprehending, collected, having removed covetousness and grief in regard to the world. Similarly, he dwells contemplating the nature of origination and vanishing in feelings, in mind, in Dhamma. This is called the development of the intense state of recollection. And what mounts is the way leading to the development of the intense state of recollection. This is noble eightfold path, that is right view, right thoughts, right speech, right action, etc. This is called the way leading to the development of the establishment of intense, to the development of the intense state of recollection. It's the end of the sutta. So here, the second uh, part, uh, that the development uh, of Satipatthana means uh, contemplating uh, the arising and the seizing factors uh, in the body, feelings, mind and Dhamma. What is the condition, uh, conditions uh, for the arising of the four objects of Satipatthana? What is the conditions uh, for the seizing? of the four objects of Satipatthana. We know uh, from previous suttas uh, that the body subsists uh, on nutriment, on food. Uh. So the arising of the body also uh, is stated by the Buddha uh, that uh, the body arises because of the coming together of mother and father and the uh, mother is in the right season and then there's a thing called Gandaba waiting to be reborn and then he enters the womb. Then after that, uh, he can only continue to survive uh, if the food nutriment uh, he gets. Uh, then the nature of seizing of the body uh, can be like there's no more nutriment uh, for the body. Uh, then the body will cease, uh, will die. Uh, uh, because there are other factors also. Uh. And then similarly for feelings, uh, feelings, uh, I was mentioned before, uh, that feelings arises because of contact. Contact at the sixth sense basis. Uh, so if there's no contact, there is no arising of feelings. Uh, and feelings vanish uh, when there's no more contact. And then mind depends on perception and feeling. Uh, when there is perception and feeling, then there is consciousness uh, and the mind starts working. So when there's no perception and feeling, the mind also will cease. Uh, and the uh, Dhamma, Dhamma is... I forgot already what was the conditions of the arising of the Dhamma and the seizing of the Dhamma, but we can refer to the earlier Sutta. Way leading uh, to the development of the Satipatthana as a noble hateful path. Okay, the, the last Sutta I'm going to read uh, is 47.42 on the Satipatthana. Monks, I will teach you the origination and the passing away of the four Satipatthanas. Listen to that. 
And what mounts is the origination of the body. With the origination of nutriment, there is the origination of body. With the cessation of nutriment, there is the passing away of the body. Now, this one I think you can understand. Huh? The body subsists on nutriment, depends on nutriment, namely food. With the origination of contact, there is the origination of feeling. With the cessation of contact, there is the passing away of feeling. Uh, so contact at the sixth sense basis uh, gives rise to feelings. When there's no contact, there's no arising of feelings. The origination of name and form, there is the origination of mind. Or uh, here, with the cessation of name and form, there is a passing away of mind. Here, uh, mind uh, should mean uh, vinyana because nama rupa arises uh, with vinyana. Uh, when Vinyana ceases, ceases, uh, then Nama Rupa also ceases. Uh. Now Vinyana also comes along uh, with perception and feeling because earlier we read one sutta uh, where the Buddha says uh, there is no coming and going of consciousness uh, without the other factors of the five aggregates. Uh. Uh, the five aggregates, they come together. Uh. Body, uh, feeling, perception, volition and consciousness. Uh. So, when you have Nama Rupa, Nama Rupa arises uh, because there is Vinyana. And when there is Vinyana, of course, it, it means that there is the other components of the mind, feeling and perception, etc. So when the mind ceases, uh, Nama Rupa also ceases. Uh, then the fourth one, with the origination of attention, there is the origination of Dhamma. With the cessation of attention, there is a passing away of Dhamma. Dhamma, there is Dhamma only when we pay attention to the Dhamma can be said to the Buddha's teachings, can be said to be the truth, reality of the world. So when you pay attention, there is a rising of Dhamma. When you don't pay attention, there is the cessation of Dhamma. Let's see what the footnotes say, 182. Note one eight two says Manasikara Samudaya Damana Samudayo. Then the commentary says the phenomena of the enlightenment factors on the should put attention on the hindrance. All phenomena come through attention, all phenomena. Okay. Mm, but the interpretation of Dhamma is phenomena. But uh, I think the Dhamma should mean uh, the Buddha's teachings. Uh, when when you pay attention, there is Dhamma, and then you don't pay attention, there is uh, oh, Dhamma. Dhamma also in some other sutta is mentioned uh, that the, when you learn Dhamma, you learn to differentiate between wholesome states and unwholesome states, uh, between skillful states and unskillful states, uh, between good and evil, etc. So if you don't pay attention, uh, you cannot see the Dhamma. When you pay attention, you see the Dhamma. So, uh, that's the end of the Satipatthana suttas uh, that I'm going to, that I'm going to read. Uh. There are a few other suttas, uh, but they are not really important, uh, and many of them are repetitions. Uh.